Nō mai, haere mai, nā mahi mai ki tēnei hui, te hui Just Kai, te kaupapo tēnei hui, tēnei rā, Community Kai and Social Enterprise. Nō mai, haere mai, nō mai. Kia ora tātou katoa. Welcome to this webinar hosted by MSD and Korihia Kai, one of our series called Just Kai, with a question mark on the end, and Bray's voice. <laughs> um, and this piece of the series is our third webinar in our series is around community kai and social enterprise. It's wonderful to have you all with us, our guests who are going to share their wisdom um, and you as participants and listeners. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Just to let you know that this is being recorded, uh, so you'll be able to have a view of it at a later date, um, but also it means that you will all be on mute uh, and we'll be using the chat function to interact with each other as we go along. So as we begin together, we prepare our space together with karakia. Yeah, inoi tato. Toia e runga, toia e raro, toia e raho, toia e roto. Tuia te here tangata, Karongo te po, Karongo te ao, Hauia, Hauia, Taakia. Yeah, kia ora koutou. It's uh, fantastic to be meeting with you all. Uh, we have about 95 registrations uh, for this um, webinar um, from all across the Motu. Uh, and so we, we hope that uh, people are available to join us. Um, but as noted, this will be recorded and will be on the Community Research New Zealand uh, YouTube account later uh, to be viewed and to be shared um, because we hope it's an important resource uh, for the community Kai sector. Uh, so my name is Neil Ballantyne. Um, I'm with the Ministry for Social Development, uh, but my background is in youth development and community development, uh, both in the South Island and here in Wellington and the Hutt Valley. Um, so I'm Rizming Yuka Government, I've uh, been there for just a couple of years now um, and I've joined um, our MSD Food Secure Communities team uh, post-COVID and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And kia ora tato. Uh, I'm Trish Malcolm and I'm the Pau Arahi for Kori Hiakai Zero Hunger Collective. Uh, but like Neil, I've had a background in youth development and community development uh, and a little bit in social service. Um, Youth workers are the original disruptors, so uh, <laughs> it's good to be in this space and to be dis disrupting a little bit around community kai so that we can bring um, food security to all in Aotearoa. Yeah, so we're just going to ask you as we will do a little bit more of an intro around who um, our organisations are and all the rest of it, we'd love for you to go into the chat function and tell us who you are and where you're from and then we can see um, as we're going along and share with you around who we've got on this uh, webinar today. So kia ora for that. Yeah, just chuck on the chat function there, just uh, yeah, who you are and which organisations you represent. Uh, so Just Kai uh, came about um, as we were starting to um, connect with communities uh, across Aotearoa and we we're starting to really connect with those at the front lines um, of community Kai um, distribution and different forms of community Kai uh, organisations. And what we're hearing is that um, people often felt quite isolated and felt quite um, sort of uh, a bit alone within the sector and not necessarily connected up. And they're wanting to hear more and more about what was happening across the country, um, some really good case scenarios, some best practice, and some things to get inspired by. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Kōtahi Kai and MSD had a chat and, and we thought that we could put on a series of webinars um, to allow that to happen. And so far we've covered uh, our initial um, webinar was around the basics around what does food insecurity look like, uh, both temporary as well as the more systemic. What does food security look like? And then moving into food sovereignty. Um, and then our second webinar was around Kōrehe Kai's mana to mana resource, uh, which went deep into some amazing matauranga um, from Te Ao Māori um, that really explored what mana is and, and how it can be um, really well addressed within the community Kai space. Um, to ensure that we recognise our own mana and recognise the mana of the clients and the people we are working with. And we've already heard um, the impact of that resource eh, around the country as, as um, different uh, community services are starting to utilise that within their practice. And so it's really cool to see that being picked up. 
So who is Kōti Hikai? So Kōti Hikai have been around for about 18 months. Uh, so if you don't know about us, that's probably why. Uh, we've come into this space to both support and disrupt, which might sound like an oxymoron, but um, that's what we're here for. We're here to be with community food and people on the ground to do the best that we can for our people on the ground. Um, but we're also here to help address the root causes of food-related poverty, which often aren't rooted in food, but are rooted more in resources. So Kuri Hikai are a team of five at the moment um, who are both full and part-time, uh, and we are, do a variety of different things, and Neil's alluded to some of those resources that we've already produced. But it's really a privilege to work alongside community and actually uh, find out what's what we, what we can do that you can't do on your own, um, how it is we can bring people together, or how it is that we can help magnify the voices that um, really speak to the impacts of food insecurity, but also the joy of food secure and food sovereign systems. So that's Kurihikai. Kia ora. An MSD Food to Secure Communities Program um, is a two-year government response uh, to the COVID pandemic. Um, initially, uh, we, the government recognised the increase in food insecurity that was happening across the, uh, across the country, and so invested $32 million over two years. Uh, initially, to meet that increased demand on community organisations uh, for emergency kai supply, essentially. Um, but then also um, to move into that food security space. So to invest into infrastructure and initiatives, which would ensure that more long-term sustainable food security out in our communities. And so, yeah, it's quite exciting to be in year two of that and seeing the amazing mahi that's happening across the country um, as community organisations get stuck in into this space. And so why social enterprise? Well, the more we're out and about and the more we are connecting, the more we're hearing uh, that um, community organisations are trying to find ways to be more sustainable. They're trying to explore um, what the charitable model looks like and perhaps um, see if there's an add-on or a, a change that could happen within the organisation um, that could bring in different types of finances, different types of putia and resources um, to help them continue their great mahi. And we've seen amazing um, examples of social enterprises happening across the country. And so we wanted to just share some of those today. And there's a lot of you that are getting into social enterprise to actually make sure that there's a level of um, money going um, to those that are actually doing the work around food. And so that whole sense of community gaining the direct uh to the, the direct financial gain from something rather than that financial gain going outside of community all the time. And so some of our amazing social enterprises around the place may not even be attached to social service or, or, or community, work, uh, community work that's gone on in the past. They're kind of new things that are really help building community enterprise and bringing that putia back into local, from local. So it's really exciting to see. And, and we just really want to uplift that. Um, and really uh, support that on the way through so that others can find other ways of disrupting their own systems because that's how we change the economic framework that we have. And I'll just say it's really awesome to have people um, on this webinar from right across the country. We've got Auckland, we've got Golden Bay, which I think is the first time we've had someone from Golden Bay, so welcome. Wanaka, uh, Otipoti, Upper Hutt, Lower Hutt. Tiawamutu, some of the regions. So it's really awesome to see some of our, um, our remote people being a part of this today and being part of this community. Mm, welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, so the way this is going to work is that we have um, some incredible presenters who will be sharing with you. Um, we'll introduce them as we go um, to, to learn more about them and their mahi. Um, but we'd love this to be reasonably interactive within our constraints. So um, if you can use the chat function to just put any little uh, little comments or feedback or, or observations that you want to make along the way, um, anything that you just sort of want to share with the crew, perhaps you've got some resources that you're aware of that you want, might want to link us to, that's all a really great space to have those sort of conversations as we're moving along. And then you'll also notice at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A function. Um, so this would really love you to use to ask a question directly to a presenter. So if in that you can write, this is a question for presenter's name, uh, and then write the question in there. Um, it'll give us an opportunity as the host, um, once a presenter finishes speaking, to ask that question to them. Um, so we're going to ask you to use the chat function initially, just for this first question. Um, so thank you for telling us who you are and where you're from. But now could you let us know what you think social enterprise might mean? What does that mean for you? Or what are the thoughts that you have when we say the word social enterprise? 
So just throw them into the, the Q&A function for this moment. And while you're doing that, I um, take great pleasure in um, introducing our first guest. It's a real privilege to have Anne Purcell with us from Akina Foundation. Akina are known for being really involved in social enterprise. And I have to say, from Kurihi Kai's perspective, they've been instrumental in helping us do some of our thinking around what it means to engage in community and how to do that in a really uplifting way, but also to kind of think about where the enterprise piece of that might need to go. Um, Anne leads the capability building team at Akina, and she has a really strong background in community-led programs and is really committed to uplifting community and all that she does, particularly around Kai. So Anne, welcome and thank you for being with us. We um, take great pride in listening to your wisdom. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. Um, oh, so great to be um, part of this conversation today. Um, so yeah, I am I'm part of the team at Akina and have been there for about three years. Um, I'm feeling the resonance of um, youth work, having been part of the a journey of some of us today. Um, but I guess way back earlier for me, I grew up in uh, on a farm in the northeast of Ireland. And we had um, beautiful rich alluvial soils and, and access to growing some wonderful veggies right where we are. And I guess my confession is as I've moved to England and to New Zealand, um, I've noticed how some of my connection to the earth has diminished. And so I'm more of a purchaser of um, kai boxes and accessing good uh, nutritious kai that way than a grower myself. But there's, there's still time yet. I might get my, my uh, hands back in the soil again. So I am um, part of the Akina team, been there um, for a few years now. And um, I just kind of, in terms of our journey of social enterprise, um, just want to very briefly harken back to in 2017, Christchurch was host to um, the Social Enterprise World Forum uh, in New Zealand. And I'm sure there may be people in this call who were part of that hui um, at that time. And just to reflect on a couple of things that have become clearer and clearer um, through and since that time. And one is, is that social enterprise is a much more a doing term than a thing term. Um, so a way of doing business, a way of trading, a way of, um, a way of doing um, business or, or being an organization. Um, and the second thing is that through the journey um, for Akina since um, 2017, we were part of an initiative with the Department of Internal Affairs, a partnership to look at what it needs for the social enterprise sector to thrive and grow in New Zealand. And one of the things that's come through really clearly from that is a much more broad encompassing notion of social enterprise here in Aotearoa, that really, rather than it being social enterprise, actually a much broader whanau, where we have community enterprise, startups, um, Māori and um, Pacific business, um, all again, steeping into uh, indigenous practices and ways of being, ways of doing business that have been um, for purpose, that have been around for thousands of years. Um, so Akina, um, as we um, work with organizations and, and the um, we've had the opportunity to work with organizations, I guess, right across the ecosystem in terms of a focus on CHI and CHI security. So some of that work has been with real flex roots uh, organizations and some as well with others like Kori Hiakai looking at their impact journey and also with corporates who are looking at how could they do business differently in terms of the Kai space. Um, at, at Akina, we, we have the capability work that we do that support people in their journey of impact and creating sustainable businesses and also impact consulting um, who work generally more with our corporate um, organizations who, who work with us. And um, we also have a couple of other areas at Akina we work in. One is um, around access to markets, again, really uh, relevant in the CHI space um, and um, under social procurement, and also about access to finance, particularly around impact investment. Um, but 
I want to kind of go delve from here into some of the types of businesses and organizations that, that we've been working with. And um, the first one I want to share with you is a, a limited liability company. They are um, it's called Okiwi Passion and are located in Great Barrier Island. And they're an organization that grow microgreens and veggies. Um, they deliver banana boxes with um, veggies um, to locals in the height of summer. That's about 150 people that would be in their um, delivery. Um, and they're so connected to the, to the earth. Their, their inspiration, and I'm just gonna use um, some of their words, is to grow high quality nutritious food that respects nature and feeds and protects the dark alluvial soils of the Okiwi Basin. Um, so the, a company that are serving their local marketplace in Great Barrier Island, one of the things that within their cyclical and circular way of working is obviously about looking to reduce the amount of food that needs to be brought um, uh, you know, by sea or air in, into Great Barrier Island. Um, and also, you know, really um, just wanting to, to have really good produce um, available. They've, um, as a business, had challenges. And one of the things that they've done is access crowdfunding to enable them to get a, a greenhouse that they, they needed. Um, and they've also, in terms of employment, been able to um, utilize the um, Mana and Mahi program to be able to employ a local uh, woman who um, is able to, you know, have their, her employment with them supported. Um, they've seen changes since COVID in terms of obviously um, woofers and having access to uh, people working within their business, but they've adapted and changed um, along with that, um, you know, along with that scenario. Um, the second business that I, I want to um, share with you um, again, provides microgreens to local um, restaurants and, and cafes in their community. Um, it's Grow Space, and they're based uh, at Mount Eden. So they're a, a, a charitable trust. Um, they uh, are very, very focused on food security and circular economy, and very focused on their local community, but with a really big vision around how they want to see access to food change. Um, they employ former refugee and migrant women as part of their business model. Um, and um, at the moment, actually an organization that we were working with just last week on looking at some of how they're, they're developing their business. And then the last couple of organizations I just wanted to talk about was one is called Sweet Release. They're based in Wellington and they're a caterer and cafe. And part of their model in terms of food security is around looking at a pay it forward model. And so um, within their community, creating a way that people, um, particularly people who are homeless um, and affordability of accessing the cafe, they build in a model where they can, there is vouchers that people can come in and utilize. And, and there's other cafes work on a, on a similar type of model. And the final one I just want to mention again in Auckland is Everybody Eats. And again, a, a business that operates around um, access to good kai using food rescue um, produce keeping their costs down in terms of the type of premises they access, um, which are used by other cafes during the, uh, the, during the day and with really strong in, um, relationships with other businesses and um, chefs you know, in, in the city um, and also have volunteers built into their model as well. But it's a pay as you can or pay as you choose model. So again, um, creating greater access. So those businesses, they, it's what they're doing in the Kai space as opposed to the business model that they're um, linked with, whether they're a limited liability company or a charitable organization. They're operating in a way to really look to how they uh, increase access to good, nutritious Kai. Kia ora, thank you, and for your introduction uh, to the social enterprise space, we really appreciate it. And I really appreciate it how you show that there's so many different models um, and ways of doing social enterprise. I know for me, when I first sort of, you know, entered in the community space and started hearing about social enterprise, it sounded big and kind of scary and a very kind of like 
you know, this is what it is and this is what it isn't, but it sounds like we've really moved so far to recognise there's lots of different ways of viewing social enterprise and incorporating it into our co papa So it's quite freeing to hear that, I think. You know, it's quite freeing to hear that there's a sort of permission given within it, I think. Absolutely, and the, and the richness of all of that diversity um, and some of the reflections that people have made around how they um, would engage around social enterprise. You know, it's about by the people, um, for the people. It's where profit and social good come together. Um, it's about sustainable practices. It's about having a reason and a purpose and then digging that back into community. And I think that you captured all of those things uh, really well with that diversity of, of different organisations you shared. So thank you so much for your wisdom um, and sharing it with us today. Mm. So we haven't had any questions come through for you, Anne, so you can relax. Oh, um, <laughs> you're a... <laughs> but, uh, we may come back to you uh, later on if we have time yeah. um, at, at the end after all the other presenters um, have thank come. You. So, yeah, really appreciate your sharing, but also uh, encourage everyone out there as well as the listening to presenters just to think of any questions that you might have for them, chuck them in that Q&A function, and we'll be able to give them to the presenters uh, at, the, at the end of their talks. So, unfortunately, time-wise, we are going to have to continue. Um, it's quite a fast-paced session, uh, so we'll move on to our next presenters. Uh, so, it's my uh, pleasure to introduce Julio Bin. Um, who uh, is part of the Southern Initiative um, and is also here today representing the Papa Toy Toy Food Hub. Uh, he's originally from Brazil uh, and had uh, a bit of traveling around the world uh, before he started his career in marketing and later specializing in sustainable uh, sustainability and sustainable business. He's worked uh, for a range of different organizations from corporations to governments to NGOs. Um, across a wide range of different projects. He joined the Southern Initiative team in 2014 um, and helped develop community-led uh, entrepreneurship uh, which, with a systems thinking approach, which I think is quite incredible to combine those two together. Um, so yeah, he's focused on food systems and supporting initiatives that will help alleviate food insecurity. He has also joined uh, by his colleague Raju um, Ramakrishna, who was born and raised in South India and moved to New Zealand in 1989. Uh, since then, he's worked for a range of different organisations, including a stint in a large government ministry, which I see has um, not been named specifically, which is, you know, that's totally fine, I understand, as a civil servant. Uh, but he's also spent four years with Healthy Family South Auckland, uh, again, predominantly focused on food systems. Uh, so he was part of the team that helped create the Food Hub model and has now dedicated himself full time uh, to the Food Hub co -papa. So welcome to you both and we look forward to your insights. Um, um, thank you, uh, Trish and uh, Neil. I think our, our presentation took, um, introduction took longer than the seven minutes we have, but uh, we'll try to keep it up. In a time, and um, I think it's uh, uh, you know rather than thank you for the invitation, and I think rather than me sharing uh, uh, the experience of the community, that's why I thought it would, would be better to hear from the community what they're doing. Um, so I'll, I'll give a brief uh, idea of what's my role from the council and TSI and healthy families uh, perspective, and then Roger is going to share his experience as as a social enterprise in the community. Um, so my job is to optimize basically the existing resources um, and help communities to navigate utilizing, utilizing what's available. Um, that includes um, knowledge and the amazing people that we have within our community. Um, I, I also try to identify when you talk about systems change, uh, the conditions they are keeping uh, the problem in, in place and I look for um, critical shifts that can enable actually those systems to change. Uh, those conditions are, uh, can be mental modes, behaviors, uh, uh, power dynamics, and it goes up to uh, policies. Um, but when it comes from to uh, alleviating food insecurity and, and food dependency, uh, supporting a local resilient uh, food system, uh, we need to understand that, that the, the, uh, it, it is a systemic problem. It's a global problem. It's, it's a local and global problem. Um, based on, on, on the way that the food systems work, uh, which is, is a mass production, mass consumption, and mass waste. Um, at the ground level, what it means for our community is that, uh, you know, there's huge nutritional inequality. Um, translating that is that people are having really good access to bad food, 
and really bad access to good food. Um, and, and we know all the um, impacts on health and well-being uh, that it, this is having to our people, um, and also the impacts on, on social, cultural, economic, and environmental um, issues. Um, I think the COVID pandemic uh, exposed those inequalities and highlighted the need for resilient local food systems um, everywhere. Um, I think it's also reinforced the need for action and sense of urgency. And um, we have been utilizing uh, the Good Food Roadmap as a strategic framework um, to help define what really means to have a resilient local food system and what's the journey from food insecurity to dependency to food security and food sovereignty. Um, so innovation is key and uh, alternative, is, alternative models are key as well for, for us to get uh, to their goal. And um, nothing better than uh, explaining or exemplifying this Cordero uh, with uh, the Food Hub Collective. And uh, again, that's why I think Raju can um, share his experience and, and, and his knowledge and everything that's happening on the ground. As, uh, and here we are, I'm, I'm supporting as a, as a support entity here next to the, uh, uh, the collective, which today is the Papa Toy Toy Food Hub and the Papa Kuda Food Hub. There you go. Awesome. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, just lovely to have this opportunity to share a little bit of our mahi uh, in, the, in, this, in this form, in this format. Um, as a segue to what Julia just said, yeah, no, it's it's awesome. This is probably one of its uh, one and only one of its kind where we can talk about public-private community partnership. Um, this this has been an operation. Uh, when I say this, I'm talking about the Papitoy Food Hub. Uh, it's been in operation for the last four years, and I mean in, from concept to uh, uh, full-on operation. Um, it's uh, we've got 13 uh, people employed there, some part-time and some full-time. <clears throat> 13 local people I'm talking about that would have otherwise been uh, um, pro probably uh, receiving help from MSD and and, and probably uh, not having hell of a lot of direction. And, and with COVID, we had a lot of jobs being axed from uh, various different fields. So we've got people from various other walks of life that actually walked in. And so what we are uh, really, uh, uh, you know, as Pepitoy Toy Food Hub, well, our main core purpose is basically about uh, enabling access to nutritious care at affordable prices. So uh, we, we, we really look at uh, what our system's all about and, and also look at the dependency model that's been deep rooted which has been carrying on for generations and generations. So our co Papa is mainly about uh, enabling people, uh, empowering them, giving them the mana. So as a, as a standing example, we've got these 13 people from diverse backgrounds, from various ethnicities, all working together uh, from our amazing kitchen, which is the white lady, the iconic white lady from downtown there, which is what we use as our current kitchen, because when we got given the property uh, where we are located, which is old Papitoitoi, uh, opposite the New World Car Park. It's an old netball court that we've uh, re-established into a community cafe. The club rooms have been converted into a community cafe and the kitchen basically is the white lady, the uh, Max Washer, uh, the owners of the white lady very happily shared um, the old uh, um, old lady and, and we, we basically uh, towed it over to Pepito and serves as our kitchen. So, and the people that are employed there are, are local people, are not uh, qualified chefs or anything, but amazingly qualified as being mums and, 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 and having gained their knowledge, ancestral knowledge, and actually coming and sharing that. So we really do uh, reflect the, uh, the community that we are um, located in. Our demography is basically a great mix of Pacific Maori and uh, South Asians and so on and so forth. So we absolutely reflect that and our food reflects that too. And when we're talk talking about affordability, we're managing to do that because of our amazing partnership with New World right next door. So what we, we are all about is reducing waste. Um, we uh, rescue anywhere between 100 to 300 kilos of produce on a weekly basis. This has been happening since September 2019 from our amazing partners, uh, New World. Um, we rescue the produce, come and repurpose it, add value to it, and uh, our therefore able to sell it to people at affordable prices. Um, our breakfasts are only $12 and our main meals are $14. And, and we're talking good island servings here. So, it, you know, it's, and we know that 
uh, what goes in, into the puku is invariably de determined by what's in your pocket. So we, we are very conscious of that. It's about uh, being good on the pocket, the puku and the planet. Um, and we, we do practice a whenua to whenua approach. So whatever does come from there just gets repurposed. What doesn't get into your puku goes back into the compost, producing some amazing fresh vegetables, which we again share with our community for a koha. <clears throat> so it's all people doing the magic. It's a whole team that's actually come together. And, and we are, like I said, we absolutely thrive on our diversity and we merge together nicely. And I think it's an amazing, uh, uh, very, very practical, tangible um, uh, initiative. And it started as a prototype, but I, I, I reckon it's more than an initiative now, more than a prototype now. It's actually a living organism and it's, uh, and it's uh, functioning. And the whole idea is to be self-sustained. Normally social enterprises start and, and finish off with the, when the funding stops, but the real aim beyond here is to actually take it further so that those people that are currently employed continue to be employed, but on the basis of what we churn out. And Food Hub is not just, uh, food is basically the catalyst that we're using because we know that food is probably the biggest connector. And uh, like Julia mentioned, there is so much access to bad food. We thought this is an op excellent opportunity to actually have access to good food at affordable prices. And also food being the connector, it's just the catalyst. But what we really want to use the space is more inspirational, aspirational, and actually educational. So that's the next level. And that's how you build resilience. And we, we don't really talk about it. We practice it. And we, we, we have our own hangi pit. So we do, do our own traditional hangis. Um, we want to celebrate all the diversity that's out there in the community. And that's one. We found that that's an amazing way of bringing people together and, um, and you know, solves your social inclusion uh, issue. Um, I can only compress so much in this time. Uh, there is so much to say in so so little a time. I would absolutely appreciate each and every one of you to uh, take time and come out and visit us at the Pepito Food Hub. Once you come there, you will just learn because every day is an evolving day. But on talking about our team, we've got uh, four generations working there, uh, four generations working together, right from 85 year old to uh, 18 year old. So you can understand, you can imagine whoa, how how we are able to organically. Uh, share the amazing knowledge coming from various generations together. And so we are thriving just there. I think I have said a wee bit. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask me if there's anything. Kia ora, Naju and Julia. Um, thank you for sharing your journey. Uh, I really encourage people to follow Papatoi Tui Food Hub on Facebook. Oh. For me, it's an inspiration seeing all this beautiful kai just popping up constantly every day of the week and seeing the amazing things that you do. It just really super, and yeah, Papa, um, oh. Papa Kura as well. Um, uh, but especially the, the veggie share boxes, they've been incredible seeing the quality of the vegetables. It's just amazing. So just huge uh, shout out to you yeah. about that. And I love yeah. you talk about- Sorry to uh, interrupt. Just sorry to interrupt, just on that point, we, we have pampered our, our veggies with uh, our own worm juice and our own amazing compost. We are so spoiled. We 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 are very short in supply with soil, so we use compost instead. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, and that's one of the things is that's, that's being innovative um, about all of those kind of practices, which is awesome. And um, I've heard Julia say that many times before. It's about puku pocket and planet, but I reckon there's a fourth P in that as well. It's people, and so just to um, help that really helps orientate social enterprise. I think those four P's for me. Um, and I really love the way that you talk about how is it sustainable. Quite often we start social enterprises with some funding and then it's actually trying to get beyond always needing to seek funding to sustain it. So that along with the employment, I think helps make those things a true social enterprise for me. Um, we're going to save the questions to the very end because they seem to be very similar. And I think that we can probably do that as a joint thing. And so um, I'm we're going to uh, move on to our third speaker of the day. It's a real privilege to um, be able to welcome Swanee Nelson into this space. She is the queen of social enterprise in my <laughs> mind. Um, I follow you on Facebook as well. And it's always incredible to see some of the really disruptive things that you've done, but really empowering and community focused things you've done, um, particularly around the Otara Kai village. So welcome to this space, Swanee. We look forward to your wisdom. Ngā mihi nui kia korua. Uh... 
and to everybody watching, nga mihi nui ki a tātou katoa. Uh, ko Swani Tukunua, ko Waimateawa, ko Whakatere Te Awa, a te maunga, uh, ko Tātara Te Marae, te Mahurehure Te Hapu, uh, ngā tuki mu te whaaro, te waka, ko Ngāpuhi Te Iwi no Ōtara Taku Kanga noho i nai nei. Um, really awesome to be here today um, and to be alongside some of these presenters who I also call friends and know very well and absolutely love their work um, to share about some of the um, amazing mahi that um, everyday residents, literally everyday residents in Ōtara have been working on. Um, for those who aren't familiar with the Ōtara Kai Village uh, here right behind me, um, it's a resident-led um, initiative co-papa under the Community Builders NZ Trust and it was developed with a vision to help change our communities mindsets and behaviors relating to food health and well-being um, and the whole model um, the whole essence of what they do is really based around kai connection and creation and hopefully people see that um, weave through a lot of the mahi that's loudly and proudly displayed through social media um, but through all of that mahi too um, is um, embedded eco-sustainable practices and and especially culture and kia orana because it is kia orana um, language week um and so yeah where it started from i think there's there's a lot of i was thinking about a few things that i could share today and i didn't really want to regurgitate a lot of stuff around sustainability and food insecurity that a lot of us already know so i thought about sharing about a few key things um um Julio mentioned two things um, in his core all um, from Profitoid Food Hub, which is around innovation and creativity. And um, I think this is a space where um, these residents have been really at the forefront in terms of dealing with a lot of the social issues that deal with food insecurity, specifically in Ōtara. Um, because as an example, um, we know that there are a lot of things that are good for families, especially around garden marakai initiatives and there were a lot of kaupapa that were brought out over the last few years um, around setting up these workshops where you could learn to do amazing things like composting and stuff but for our community in particular it's not that they weren't interested in it it's just the priority there were other priorities and those priorities were about ensuring that we could keep our houses warm keep our lights on get food on the table and so what the team have really worked to do is yes meet the immediate need of kai but also through that, be innovative and creative in, in terms of building the community together so that we could educate and model these things that are also important and bring sustainability and whānau um, without saying it blatantly to their faces, as an example, go build a garden, blah, 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 um, because that traditionally hasn't worked in our community. Um, so this particular project um, started literally with a 40-foot shipping container that was donated from Pānaku. Um, it was dropped on um, the lawn of a residence property here in Ōtara because there was no money to house this. Um, there was no money behind it at all, actually. All there was was willing hearts and um, moi moia, a passion and aspiration, a dream from neighbours to find a solution to some of the issues around food insecurity in Ōtara. And this was prior to COVID. Um, so when COVID hit, um, it kind of got fast tracked and it was like, oh my goodness, we need to do something now. So over six months, um, a bunch of neighbours across Ōtara went to this resident's house and they did as much of the fit out of this container as possible. And then thankfully managed to secure a grant through the Women um, Fund, Waste, a Waste Minimization Fund. And that gave um, the Rōpū just enough to get contractors to do some of the harder things around the welding and so forth. Um, at that time when the project had started, um, there was no location on where this container was gonna go. I remember one resident turning up one day and saying to the group, so where's the food coming from? And everyone's like, we don't know, but it'll come. <laughs> Another conversation, where's it gonna be, you know, where's it gonna be landed? We don't know, but there will be a location. And so it was very much a faith-based um, um, co-papa when they executed it. Um, fast forward a bit, um, so thankful, um, Auckland Transport managed to find out that Auckland Transport owned a piece of land in the Ōtara Town Centre that originally used to be called Muggers Lane. And um, we dropped one container and that one container is now morphed to about five containers. Um, and out of those containers, a couple of things happen. Um, one of them is a social cafe. 
So um, a few families that had lost their jobs through COVID, basically they were supported back into a new um, type of employment, types of businesses, um, being making food, good healthy food into the container um, without the financial constraints of the traditional commercial environment. Um, and a lot of them have thrived and moved on. Some um, discovered that actually this isn't for me, I wanna do something else. And it's probably good that they failed there because they left without any financial debts and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it enabled the community basically to get access to really good food. And this was the first time we were able to provide plant-based foods in the Otara Town Centre. People didn't quite believe it. And there was also a lot of you know, comments about, oh, do people from Otara even eat plant-based? You know, those kinds of stigmas. and. Those plant-based operators were con constantly selling out every week, literally every week. And it, what it revealed is we do want to eat healthy, even though the Otara Town Centre is loaded with lots of fried chicken and taro for nobody who's been there. And we do want to eat good foods, but we don't have access. Uh, there's one Subway and now there's a sushi store. But in terms of two of those versus 12 chicken stores, it's very difficult. Um, so, um, yeah, a lot of awesome work has been able to be done and everyone that was running it at that time were volunteers. They were all the residents that worked on the project up until beginning of this year when they've all finally um, become employed, which is really amazing. Um, and one of the things that they've worked religiously on was about, you know, bringing the community on the journey and how can we basically um, feed in this education but in a way that works for community. So within one year, um, they were able to build, generate a following of 10,000 10, plus followers. Um, and about 65% of those are actually from Otara. And what it did is it provided a real amazing platform to then, you know, by the way, did you know this and this? Did you know you could do this um, while doing the things that mattered? And how they did that was they, kind of changed their strategy to focusing on what matters for the community is what we're going to do. So if you look at a lot of the stuff that's done at the Otarakai village, like there is a variation of things that are celebrated. I mean, they even celebrated um, a shop owner who was one of the lo longest standing shop owners in Otara, a Chinese man. He was client closing his Chinese store and moving back to China and they threw a big leaving party for him. And for someone looking at that might be, what was the point of that? But um, the community wanted it, and so we did it. We did what the community mattered, and every time we did events like that, it brought more of the community into the space, allowing us a platform to then communicate a lot of the things that we want to communicate to Fano around getting them into places where they're thriving again. And so, um, one of those was the creation of the new Marakai as well, which is located at Habitat for Humanity, who gifted some land. And so um, one of the things that they're doing, looking at doing moving forward, I mean, we've now generated like th literally thousands um, of emails from people who've come through, through the various events and they're about to launch like a, a community uh, mail distribution email, which is going to run off something like the Autata Kumara line. Um, because information is so fragmented, it was around about how can we consolidate that info, because what we're doing isn't the only thing that can help Fano. there's actually a series of things that need to be working um, in tandem together to help our Fano out of these situations, and we're only a dime in a bucket, and so those are one of the cool things that they're looking at executing out. Um, and in terms of sustainability and social enterprise, that's something that they're still working on. Um, it's very difficult. Obviously, it's only been about a year and a half that they've been in operation. Um, this is one of the core things that they're kind of trying to focus around. And they've got a couple of things that they do in order to do that. Obviously, we receive in koha from um, vendor and operators that utilize the cafe. Um, and that utilize different places, containers within our space, because we've also got a kiosk. We've just opened a karaoke store out of another container, so you can hire that. Um, and we're about to launch out wide our merchandise line, which is called Inclusive. And the catchphrase for that is look good, do good. And that merch is quite popular. Um, and a lot of it's already been driven out into the community over the last couple months, and it's always highly sought after, but we've only just got our Shopify store up and running literally about a week ago 
and that'll be going live in the week after next. And so there's all these little things, um, aside from other big things that trying to work on to build in income so we can get, like Julio and them said, staff to a point where they're employed from the funds coming in. But until then, at the moment, we're still very much heavily reliant on funding that comes through. And MSD have been an amazing support through the MSD Food Secure Grant, especially in terms of helping the space get their wings and just grow the, their capability and cap capacity over the last couple of months. Um, so yeah, that's where they're at at the moment. Um, and I, I think probably if there's more specific questions that people want to ask, um, that, that'll probably be better, then you can get you know specific info that you might want to help. But hopefully some of that, some people may have found some value in some of those things. Oh, kia ora, Swani. I really appreciate your sharing. And I have actually visited uh, Otara uh, Kai Hub and it was such a nice space, you know, just like the good vibes that you guys have created there with the colour and the way that you've fitted out those containers and the whole space uh, just really does create that sense of community. And I like really, really love that. Um, but yeah, also just love how you've shared about um, how this project has come out of faith, you know, come out of a, seeing a community need and going, we need to do something. And we don't have all the answers, but we're going to start somewhere, just getting that shipping container and getting stuff underway. Um, and that's incredibly inspiring. Um, but obviously, you now in that space of creating sustainability, which is super cool. Yep. It's, I think probably one of the key things that I'll probably share with people is that um, sometimes when we look, when we talk about a ground up approach, like it really authentically is, and it, it has this. It has its risks in some way, but I guess this is kind of like the space we sit in in terms of trusting residents and their solutions and building on their capacity. And what I mean by that is all those that are working and involved in the space, they're involved first and foremost because they live here, they live through the, they have lived experiences, they know the issues, they have a heart for Otara and they really want to contribute back. But mm. we're the where was the capability and so I guess where I've had to fit in over that year was actually um, exposing them and educating them around the other land space and this to connect the dots between community and how it work, working with central or local and central government and stakeholders and who, how does that work and so as of last week like I literally I'm, I'm no longer the CEO that baton has been handed off officially to two new directors who okay. were and none of them have tohu none of them actually actually have any formal education or uh, formal certificates around the space and one of the things is developing their capacity in those areas, but working with everyday residents to solve those issues because they live there and then building on the rest. And so this is a model that has, a, yeah, I guess, utilised those who are traditionally well-versed in all these other areas of the full landscape of the space. It really was mm. working. But hopefully the model shows that if you are intentional about it, if you put your trust in residents and if you work well with them to build the capacity it really does work it can this is a result it can work cheers Swanee. inspiring words to finish on and thank you for your time we're gonna to have to move on quickly um so it's now my pleasure to introduce uh panapa iho uh he originally uh hails from the mighty Toria, uh has a degree in marketing and management and is a co-founder of numerous social enterprises um, and is hugely an important part of Hikarangi Enterprises, which I'm hoping that Panapu will talk more about today. So uh, welcome, Panapu. It's great to have you here. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, ko Hikarangi te maunga, ko Waipui te awa, uh, ko Ngāti Prou me Ngāti Ue Poatu, uh, Ngā Iwi, uh, I quote to Uri a Māui a te tai rāwhiti. So yeah, my name's Panapu Eho. Um, Hail from Ruatoria, um, and I'm the Kai Fakahaire of Hikarangi Enterprises, one of the founding um, directors about six or seven years ago, um, something like that. And um, yeah, Hikarangi Enterprise. Oh, actually, I just want to acknowledge the other the other speakers. Um, yeah, lots of inspiration, and um, yeah, look forward to connecting at a different time. Um, so Hikarangi Enterprises was set up a, out of a need for. Uh, econ sustainable economic development to be focused on within our within within our area. We don't have a huge population, but we are quite remote. We're mostly um, most of the income in the tight Afati or on the northern east coast is primary production, so high volume, low value. 
products um, that only uh, get kind of go through the value system once. So we're talking about pines, hard herbed animals, and a little bit of um, grain. And so a number of community, another a number of community members came together and looked at how can we have high value products uh, that look after the land and look after the people at the same time. Um, we've spun a number of um, entities into uh, into life. Um, we have a medicinal cannabis uh, entity. We um, work in housing, uh, business development, um, and kai. Uh, and also looking at uh, nutraceuticals out of uh, native species or polymer species. Um, so I, that's that's kind of. Um, what economy enterprises exist to be. Um, it was never set up to be a proven provider or to grow a mechanism. Um, and so, you know, just on the on the note around structure, there isn't actually a social enterprise, a very pertinent social enterprise structure in New Zealand. Um, we we kind of have to make do with what we've got, but we've been able to do that along the way. Um, jump through a few hoops, but when you're people centered, um, you kind of, as we all are, you just kind of, you kind of do the do that needs to be done. Um, in the Kai space, um, one of the models that um, I, I come, you know, my, I grew up eating out of my mother's garden and that provided most of our Kai. And so she's kind of been the inspiration for all the space and Kai have always had gardens um, my whole life. And nine, uh, eight year, nine years ago, I moved back to Ruatoria um, to have my children so they knew where they would be from and one of the key things that we wanted to have for our children is that they knew where their clay came from and so through that um, we grew a whole lot of clay ended up tutoring at the local polytech course around clay and fast forward through to last year there was the thing in COVID where all the all the roads closed because we shut off our borders here and the only clay that was coming in pretty much it was either out of the hills or out of the sea or in trucks from all, all around the place. And so what we've done is we've set up a collective of local growers and we've supported them to um, set up social enterprises themselves and we'll go into business. And we're helping them develop their capacity to supply to a local kai box. So essentially all we're doing is cutting out the middleman um, and using a community supported agriculture model where Farno get to grow on their whenua, they get to stay home, um, they get to create incomes for their families, which increases their well-being. Um, they get a better price point for their product um, rather than selling it to um, big chains or into middlemen. And then the farno at the other end, they get local organic fresh kai that you can't buy. And it's grown with love and it's grown organically with natural inputs, all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that we know that's good. And so we've been running that um, for about six months and we, we put some funding in to, um, to start that. And it was really done, in, it, when we started it, it wasn't, um, we were, it was a funded thing, so it wasn't self-sustainable like a social enterprise, but what we're, what we're just starting to do now is that the boxes are paid for, so you have people that already buy Kai boxes um, and they're gonna, they're gonna come over. And essentially what they'll be doing is you have someone that buys the equivalent of my food box or the kai box or whatever it is um, but this is a locally based um, initiative and what any profits that would come from that they just go into subsidizing whanau that can't afford that kai so whether they're low-income working families or beneficiaries um, whatever it is but one of the things that we're not into is handouts is that we really want to perpetuate um, hand ups and so everybody that receives a, um, a subsidized box has to give back to the community in, a, in another way. So it's, really, it's a really simple model. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the key or some of the key learnings that we're getting out of it, and, uh, and as many of you um, that are on the call will, will know of, is that when stuff is done by the people, for the people within the community, you get the ripple effects uh, of increasing in well-being you, with the mana that's part of that. Um, and kind of the biggest issue that we're coming that we're, we're facing now is how we 
not get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, we really need to invest into the people that we're bringing along on this journey. So with the growers um, and all the bits and pieces that the scaffolding that they need around them, the, the whanau that we've brought on to run the distribution uh, mechanisms, um, the scaffolding that they need, whether it's coming off the benefit for 15 years or um, being able to understand the regulatory hoops that you have to come through. So uh, like has been spoken about, there's a lot of the roles that we have, we are really having to develop the capacity of people. So it's not only the kai itself, but it's the development of the expertise or the capacity and capability of the people. That's, that's the game changing stuff. That's where we're able to shift the needle within the community. And it doesn't matter if it's kai or housing or whatever. It's by us. It's, it's not a... It's not a model where you're funded for five minutes and it disappears. So it's better to be small. And if all we do is influence a handful of people and that change changes the fabric within that family for the next generation, then we're winning. And so that's the model that we're on. We're not here, we're not here to do this for one, two, or five years. We're here to set this up as a body of knowledge that can be passed on to the next generation or the next CEO or whoever comes on and they can make it their own. Um, some of the one of the biggest challenges is actually getting people to have confidence in themselves. But we all know is that once you have someone within or one or two within the community, um, and it's usually the smallest, it's really minor things that really breaks the back of their camel to be able to have confidence in themselves. Like things that we all take for granted that are everyday things. Um, it's those small bits of, an example is someone who came on to run our distribution and she, she was really struggling to make decisions based on putia or money that was coming from externally because she didn't, that responsibility felt, felt really big for her. And we just said to her, look, whatever decision you make, we'll back you, or I'll back you, that the buck won't stop with you. You make the decision, whatever the decision, decision is the right decision at the time and so when you have multiple wins of that it shifts the needle of how people view themselves and so while that's a challenge it's also the most the most rewarding thing so um, we we also have been challenged with well how do we make this bigger the whole capitalist thing how do we make this bigger how do we get um like for us we we've got a community of about 1300 people and we just want to develop the capacity that we can grow for our 1300 people so if the road collapses or petrol stops or COVID comes back in a big way, then we're self-sufficient and we know that these things are going to happen into the future. So that's, that's all we're aiming for. We have the internal mechanisms within our own area to be 1,300. And if it expands because people move home, which they will, then we'll expand with it. But we're not trying to take over the world. We're not trying to get up to and compete with my food bag and compete with market share. We're just trying to look after our own. And I think that's a, that's a strength in the story. People get it, people buy into it, they want to support it. Yeah, I think that's the, um, the overview of kind of the Kai stuff. But the model is we're doing that in other things. We're doing it in housing. We're doing it in job creation. Um, oh, sorry, one thing to add is that um, once we do the Kai, uh, the, 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 the vegetables, um, and at the moment, we're buying meat in and all that kind of stuff. But we'll, we'll then go into the space of doing meat, doing value-add products um, so that we can encompass more opportunities for our whānau to engage, have incomes for their families and utilise our um, resources that are around us. Kind of get away from the, the, as much as we can from the need to be driven by the almighty dollar. Yeah, um, Noreda, um, that's kind of us in a nutshell um, and something that we're doing. And uh, yeah, Hopefully it provides some kind of inspiration or something or anything for anybody. And yeah, kia ora koutou. Tēnā, koe panapa, namahinui ki tō korero. What you have to say is really insightful and I think that it, it, for me, gives voice to one of those struggles, particularly, sorry, Neil, that comes from government quite often and that is the scalability of something. And I just love that actually all of our, our presenters today what has been at the at the heart of all of it is community, listening to community, community doing community, um, and community solving community's problems, if you like, but also finding joy and um, 
connection in the way that we can provide for ourselves within ourselves. Um, and and Panapa, I think you gave really good voice to that. You're not about trying to solve the world's problems. You're actually trying to do sustainable community where you are with your people. Um, and and I think that just is, is a really amazing um, piece of what you have to share with us today and, and a challenge actually to challenge back on that sense of the kind of capitalist scaling out, making it bigger, always going one step further is actually how about we do this thing really well and really sustainably so that the transformation that happens is is true transformation. So Kilda and Tenakwe. Mm, I think just, just, a, just a tiny little thing to add is while we're absolutely focused on acting locally, we're thinking about how it can be implemented globally so that we can give all the knowledge that we develop for others. Yeah. Mm. Kia ora. Great. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time together and we are trying to um, honour people's time and respect people's time so we won't go um, too far further. Um, we have received a couple of questions and so what I might do is send that out to our panellists um, following the end of this webinar and then um, collect some written responses and put that into a follow-up email um, to all who registered so that you'll get some, some of the insights uh, into things that have been questioned um, so far and that's some really good sort of nuts and bolts stuff around startup funding, around what things help with sustainability into the long term um, and, you know, sort of taking people along that journey. So we'll, we'll look into that, um, yeah, yeah, after, yeah, after the exactly. session. And so, yes, this has been recorded and will be edited within a week or two, and then we'll get it up online on the YouTube account of Community Research NZ, uh, who we thank for their support uh, during this webinar. And um, everyone who you've um, seen presenting today, you know, has a presence on social media. So we, um, we do encourage you to connect to their Facebook pages or uh, through LinkedIn or whatever, um, if you want to have some follow-up conversations, because there's an almighty amount of wisdom um, being offered there. And unfortunately, we've been a little bit mean to them to only give them such a short amount of time um, within a webinar. And so I'm sure they have many more stories that they would like to share, given the opportunity. And we would just really like to thank every one of our presenters today. Uh, your wisdom, your time is precious, but also the people that you bring with you into this space. And we know it's not just you, but your whole communities that are around you and support you. So we really thank you for what you have shared with us, the challenges, the insight and wisdom, um, and your groundedness. So yeah, tēnā koutou. Yeah, tēnā koutou. So we'll finish up now, we'll finish with Karakia uh, and then we um, will let you go about your day and we hope that it is a, a, a wonderful day. This Karakia really speaks of how we um, weave our wisdom together so that um, uh, we can take that with us and affect the people around us. So if you know it, please join in. But um, inoe tātou. Tuia i runga, tuia i raro, tuia i waho, tuia i roto. Tuia te hiri tangata, ka rongo te pō, ka rongo te ao, haumire, huire, taikire.